we're going to talk about growth and development in a very, a very overview way, in a very, very general, get you thinking about things way. And I know you're spending some time with your feeder programs later today, and I think this becomes very significant. My counterpart's going to talk about safety and injury prevention a little bit. Understanding basic growth de and development and issues related to that are a means of safety and injury prevention. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Talk about that in a little bit. I want you to start out, I handed out, there's some case studies sitting on the back, and I want you to look at case study number four. There are other case studies here. These are all hypothetical, all hypothetical, by the way. But these are all situations some of you may find yourselves in. I want you to look specifically at number four. And you may not be a basketball coach. You may be a hockey coach. You may be a soccer coach. You may be a football coach. You may be a wrestling coach, volleyball coach, softball, baseball. But think about this. You've just been hired to coach underclassmen, younger kids, and you're working with your feeder program and that varsity coach's expectation is that you run the same style of play. Think about it. If you were in this situation, what would you do? In this case, it's an up-tempo style, lots of three-point shooting, Find the fundamentals that are necessary. Yep. Yeah. Strength in shooting. Sixth graders might not shoot a single three-point shot all year. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> girls. Particularly girls. Depending on how much prior experience they've had. And one thing that I was on sabbatical last winter with the Grand Rapids Public Schools Athletic Department. One thing I do know is a lot of the middle school, sixth grade teams, that's the first time young women participated in a sport. So it's very likely on that sixth grade team, you might have a young lady who's not, or a young man, but more likely a young woman who hasn't touched the equipment before. And they might have the f physical uh, capability, but they don't have the skill development to shoot a three-pointer. Now, they might huck it up there, and when I say huck it up there, I'm talking all sorts of odd and awkward adjustments you make to your shot to get it up there, which is where the root of all poor shooting form comes. So food for thought, if you're the sixth grade or even maybe seventh and eighth grade coach and this is where your varsity coach is expecting you to be, <coughs> developmentally appropriate would be helping them be the best shooter they can be, helping them develop strength and endurance in their legs and ability to shoot. If you're going to play up tempo, you've got to play some defense, so making them strong in their, you know, in their defensive game. But developmentally, sixth graders can't run and pass and catch like some seniors. And then shooting at, letting kids shoot threes, enabling them to shoot threes, forcing them to shoot threes, <coughs> or other skills that they are not developmentally strong enough to do at their age is where we learn bad habits, bad shooting form. So if we've got a sixth grade team who isn't properly coached, who is taught, you know, we, well, you got to get behind the arc. You got to shoot threes. You got to th shoot threes. And shooting the three, the distance is more important than how they shoot. That young person is going to become a junior and a senior, and their shooting form is awful. Their technique isn't going to be solid and they're not going to be as accurate. So keep that in the back of your mind in some of these other situations we may get to at the end of this period. If not, there are some significant ones you might face in your feeder programs, number two and number eight particularly, I might draw your attention to. So a little true and false. This is for middle school coaches. True or false, middle school coaches, you should encourage a student athlete to s specialize in one sport. True or false? How many say true? 
That's completely false. True or false, it's okay for a 7th and 8th grade team to scrimmage against 6th grade as long as coaches are all present. How many of you think that's true? False, <laughs> that's totally false. Actually, it's an MHSA rule. Can't do it. All you coaches. Anytime you're in practice, anytime you're in a practice or competition, as long as kids are the same age, it's okay to pair them up. Put them against each other. Is that true or is that false? That's false. And you're going to find out why here in a little bit. You should skill match, size and physical maturity match, not just age group match. True or false? It's coaches. We are in educational athletics. It is a coach's responsibility to give all student athletes equal opportunity to learn all skills and positions. Is that true? Or false? That is true. So with that in mind, if you revisit these case studies later, these talk about those individual athletes in cases that challenge this. And you just said, I heard you say it, absolutely, that's our job, to teach all kids all skills. I heard it. I, um, I should have recorded it. It is being recorded. So, thanks to, I'm going to breeze through a few of these quick. Coaches. Athletes are a combination of biology and sociology. In other words, nature and nurture. DNA and social influence and environment. And Grand Rapids Public School athletes are a unique combination of that. And we'll talk, our, we'll talk about that before we leave today. There's some unique influences from the environment. But also, I'm going to talk about this statistic from a growth and development perspective. And when I say research says, or evidence, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about some willy-nilly study done by two people. I'm talking about hard, fast, well-documented, well-done, very reliable, generalizable research. So the evidence I'm talking about, when I say evidence, there's evidence out there that says, or there's research out there that says, I'm citing very, very valid, highly cited, well-documented stuff. So 70% of kids drop out by, of sports age 13, which is somewhere between, what, eighth grade and ninth grade, right? And the rate for girls is much higher than boys. R rate for girls is much higher in boys. And if you factor in the intersection of race, ethnicity, and, and social class, if you factor in race and ethnicity and social class, you'll see that non-white kids, this is even higher, particularly in girls. And you're thinking, well, I know why they drop out, and I know from my work here with Grand Rapids Public Schools in the middle school levels, there's a, tends to be a lack of, I hear, well, there, girls don't want to go out for sports. And so I want this conversation on growth and development here a little bit to encourage you to better understand why that is, and you'll have a chance with your feeder programs to talk about what to do. So let's talk about, with that in mind, kids quit. Kids drop out. They don't play. You know, there's a big drop out. Well, let's first of all look at maturity. Perhaps you've all heard girls mature faster than boys. Girls are typically mature, reach their maximum maturity level earlier than boys do. And you can see there's a little difference here. This really, really accelerated growth for boys averages in sixth and seventh, they start. They grow the most typically between eighth and ninth grade. So you might send a young man home from your eighth grade team, and he's five foot two and weighs 100, and pound, 100 pounds soaking wet, and he might come back a man. You just don't know. Likewise, girls start to develop mature physically much earlier. And those of you who coach young women, and I know a lot of you do, this is frightening to me and I'll tell you why. Because the evidence 
with um, non-white children. The evidence with non-white children shows not only do they physically develop at a younger age, but then they start to menstruate, menstruate at a younger age. In other words, they can get pregnant and start that sexual curiosity at a much younger age, 9.5 years old, 10 years old. So coaches who coach girls, particularly in these younger ages, I would like you to think of sports participation as a preventative measure. And the research is thick and the research is vast that participation, not winning championships, that growth and developmentally, sports done right for girls, and we'll talk about what done right is coming up here. Sports done right for girls is the num one of the number one predictive, preventative measures against early sexual activity and pregnancy. They say no, because they understand the risk. The combating factor is that research is thick and vast, that for boys, participation in sports actually kind of sets their sexual prowess and sexual conquest in high gear. So you've got these young men who are very eager, and you've got these young women who are trying to put the brakes on and say no. Without sports participation in, that builds self-worth in young women, we all, we know, I've talked to several coaches in the Grand Rapids Public School District about middle school girls and what happens. You can make a difference in both of these young people, understanding growth and development. So, again, dropout at a young age. Part of it, think of their growing and changing. But prior to this, and really, physically, prior to this this growth spurt in puberty, girls and boys have the same capability. They can play against each other. They can play contact sports against each other for the most part. In some sports, sometimes you get an early maturing girl and a late maturing boy and she can take it to them. She can take it to them. In all sports, coaching and allowing kids to play co-ed is actually very healthy. Growth and development, emotional and social growth and development, letting kids play together, girls and boys play co-ed, is a very important piece in teaching respect for others. And it, that other slide where I talked about sexual activity, early pregnancy, da, 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 early conquest, it helps suppress that a little bit. It's, again, preventative. I was going to say something else about this. Um, I can't remember. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. So, when we're th thinking about early dropout, when we're thinking about that 70% of those kids that drop out, growth and development wise, here's how there are social influences, there are cultural influences, but there's also this growth and development piece and sports done right. If I'm an early mature, chances are my coach has used me in ways that benefit my team. In other words, I have been made into a star. I'm bigger, faster, stronger. I've been put in the most important position. I've been specialized already as the quarterback, the pitcher, the whatever. And now all of a sudden I'm not the early mature anymore. Everyone's catching up and I'm freaking out. I don't know how to handle it and it's not fun because my coach has emphasized winning over growth, appropriate developmental stages. Think about that. Not understanding how growth and development relates to participation as a coach, late matures give up. They give up. Gosh, I'm in eighth grade and I'm still four feet tall and weigh 75 pounds. I'm not good at anything. I get crunched. Nothing good comes for me. I'm going to quit. So there's some of it. But these other two are really important. We do, we do have control. We don't have control over biology. We can't make a 6'9 kid 5'5". Five five. We can't make a 5'5 five five kid 6'9". We can't do that. 
but we can have some understanding of what goes on here and how important it is to, to, to see early maturing and late maturing and help kids understand. Kids drop out. Kids drop out because they're, the, the focus, wh what is focused on, which is typically success and winning over growth and development, least issues. Now, here's an interesting one. These two kids are Little League World Series. These two guys are the same age. Birth certificate proven, same age. 6'9", 2'4", okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, I'm a basketball coach. I look at this guy, and you know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, he can't guard him, so I'm going to put his back to the basket, and I'm, he's going to score a million points, and then maybe not every kid on my team is going to grow to be 6'9", but a lot of guys are going to grow to be 6 feet, and they're going to be able to defend him, you know, sag on him. And now he's not going to have any ball handling skills. He's not going to have any passing skills. He's not going to have any other skills. And I've ruined him from a growth and development standpoint. But the other, the other piece that's important to understand about when we talk about the true and false question about size and skill, physical maturity matching, if this were a contact sport, you could be in real trouble for allowing this guy to play against this guy or using this guy intentionally to dominate. There's some, there are some, this is why we say, this is why the, the question, the true and false question was, the response was, yeah, you do need to watch physical skill because there are lawsuits. Parents have won, kids have won. This happened to be a football player, you know, kind of an A team and a B team playing against each other. Coaches, athletic director, superintendent, principal, negligent. Because they allowed skill mismatches in a contact sport and one kid got hurt. You are liable and you're going to hear all about that from Rick in a little bit. You'll hear more. So, this understanding of growth and development is much more important than thinking about plugging in the best kids to win sometimes. You do owe a duty of care to the little guy and to the big guy or girl. Okay, so how do I know? Where do we go? What, how do I start? How do I know what is developmentally appropriate? How do I know what's developmentally appropriate? Kids, first of all, you have to understand why kids participate, to have fun. What is fun? What is fun? I, I talk about this all the time and I get looks and I don't have my glasses on purposely right now because I know you're looking at me like willy. Fun means, well, Dr. Monk, you just think kids need to just be willy-nilly and not compete. I, nothing's further from the truth. Nothing's, I didn't enjoy coaching when I didn't win. I hated coaching when I didn't win. I hated it. But man, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Kids of all ages play to have fun. And if you want to, if you want to support for that, look at how many professional athletes and college athletes aren't having fun. They aren't having fun. Win or lose, they aren't having fun. Think fun, and we'll talk about what fun is in a minute. The other piece is Kids play when they feel they gain self-worth, and I call it the ABCs. They feel some type of acceptance, some type of belonging, and they feel some type of competence. Competence comes from you understanding where they are at devel developmentally and not asking them at too young of an age to be a grown-up. And when they're <coughs> grown-ups or older kids and they're a little less physically capable, a little less intellectually capable, we're not poking fun at them, putting them down, allowing that kind of behavior. That we self-worth, self-worth. Not just self-esteem where, what's your name? Andre. Where Andre does something, uh, makes a nice pass or a nice play, and I say, nice pass, Andre. You know, he's like, oh, nice pass. Self-worth, 
self-worth. Andre, I, you really demonstrated that you have an understanding of the game right there because that, that was a really good pass to make. He did it. He did it. His knowledge did it. So developmentally, what do kids mean by fun? And I'm using a tennis example. Research. <laughs> this was a study done with USA Tennis. USA Tennis, meaning thousands and thousands and thousands of tennis players. Eight, nine-year-olds, think about this. Plug this in your own sport. What's fun? Hitting the ball. Using the equipment. I don't care where I hit it. I just want to hit it. I want to be a part of the action. Nine-year-old, not only did I hit it, but now I can hit it hard. So what? It goes 82 courts down. I hit it to their side. But I have some control. Ten-year-olds, hmm, now friends. I like, I like the social piece of this. Eleven-year-olds, that, that competition against others start to come in. But same ability. I was on, during my sabbatical, there were some issues with some of the, some imbalance. And it, some, I, there might be coaches in here, there might be ADs in here. And I'm not demonizing, gosh knows I'm not demonizing anyone, because this happens everywhere. But at the middle school, depending on who had kids years ago and who's in your district, it's very likely you have one team that can win in a lopsided fashion. Maybe they have early, more early matures. Maybe they have kids who have had more access to training. And all heck broke loose, and sportsmanship became an issue because one team was, you know, being accused of running up the score and dominating the other. Kids are looking for a chance. Developmentally correct. Paying attention to growth and development helps find balance. This is often why we separate 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Then you see as they get older, now I'm okay playing someone better and then beyond 13 to 15, yeah, winning is pretty cool. More understanding. So think about that with your own age group, your own kids, and your own sport. My favorite personal example, and, and I lose track of what story I tell to when and what about develop sports done right, development of the correct sports. I watched um, football, age group football. I want to say it was 8, 9, and 10, 9, 10, and 11. And there was also, you know, a weight. They had to be from 60 to 110 pounds. 60 to 110 pounds. I mean, that's 50 pounds of something on someone. On that particular day, I watched, they played on a full-size field. It was all wrong. They played on a full-size football field. Eight, nine, and ten-year-olds in full pads. Full, full pads. They didn't have mature throwing, kicking, catching, running skills. There was no scoring in the game. Two, two kids got carried in off in an ambulance. You know, it was, br it was brutal. But this was what was most telling to me. The game ended. <coughs> <coughs> snack mom, of course, was there because we know snack mom is part of what makes it fun, or snack dad or snack family. <coughs> Those kids ripped off their helmets, and they ripped off their, their, their uniforms and pads. They grabbed the bag of balls. They nearly mugged the coach, grabbed the, the mesh bag full of footballs, went over in a field and started to play football. They were bored to tears with adult rules. It was wrong. And all those kids in uniform, little, big, who didn't get to touch the ball, didn't get to touch the equipment, didn't get to be a part of the action, in that field afterwards got to be part of the action. And the laughter and the giggling and the energy, they were exhausted themselves so much that they came back to the snack mom for more. But at any rate, so I'm going to kind of breeze. You have these in your notes, and I'm going to just touch on these, touch on these quickly. So look at this in six phases. And the phases here that are in yellow are the ones I think are most relevant to you. But I'm going to, because I know GRPS is interested in, in expanding youth sports, I'm going to touch on it. Youth sports, no strategy. No strategy, just basic locomotor movements. That's what should be focused. Um, 
I know that you have a youth track program, and along with some maybe running form, the kids should just play games, fun games, back and forth, simple rules, maybe some ethics and sportsmanship, congratulating other runners when they do something. <clears throat> but I also need, oh, I don't know how to change this computer. I don't like it when it does this. The other thing at this age, and actually a little bit into the phase two, Small equipment, smaller balls, modified court, shorter game time, simplified rules. Remember, the kids just want the activity. And I have the benefit. My daughter goes to North Park Montessori, and so she's a part of the little kids track program. And they, they, she just loves it. She just loves it. And, of course, at the meets, you know, they run, a, I think, maybe a little quarter-mile run, which is cool. And, of course, then there's snacks. But, you know, there's all kinds of fun and playing tag and, you know, a little bit of working on, you know, a little bit of arm form. They played some game, take it off your shoulder and put it in your pocket. Take it off your shoulder, you know, shoulder pocket. A little bit of high knees. They acted like they were stepping on hot coals, you know, trying to, that's it. That's it. And it was beautiful. And it was perfect. And thousands of kids went out for, for track and they'll probably go out again because they had a great experience. If you're thinking about running programs for elementary kids, maximum an hour practice a week in a competition. You could even skip the practice and just have an extra long warm up. No scoring, no leagues. Fun and lots of activity. Here's where we start to get a little more involved, but not a lot. Notice we're thinking about speed and endurance, but through fun. Think about relay games. Think about games that playground games I once watched a tennis coach well it's not more than once I've seen it several times a tennis coach running youth tennis camp and they have their sm you know the small rackets and they don't use real tennis balls they use there's a you know foam kind of nerfy spongy tennis ball so it's light well he went one step further and got balloons he went one step and blew up. So he, first of all, they're outdoors, and he opens up this bag of a bazillion balloons. And, you know, some of them pop right away. But then the whole idea is the kids just have to run around and try to use the racket to keep the balloon in the air as many times as they can. Screaming and laughter and screaming and laughter, and they're out of breath because they don't have a lot of racket control and the wind's taking it. Simplest game in the world, and whoever... It was like the last balloon unpopped, got a popsicle, you know, some, some small gift. Developmental. Kids are old enough to start to be taught about warming up, you know, their bodies. It's important to start talking about their bodies as a, you know, as, a, as, a, as it relates to physical activity. Getting their heart beating. Why do we get our heart beating? We get our heart beating because our muscles need to warm up. We need to stretch out. We need to cool down. How do we fuel? Very simple. Give them water breaks. Think about focus of attention. Here, here's where we start to make some interesting, I think, adult goofs. We start to push them into strategies. Full five on five, 11 on 11, whatever our team is. We have a baseball or or we're playing kids little league or whatever and we start to push them into long bouts of activity. Long where focus of attention we should play short mini kinds of games. And if I use this tennis coach as an example, you know, there was a mini tennis. Low net, small court, mini tennis to a point or two, then off to do something else that had nothing to do with tennis. Game. Sharks and minnows, just to condition. Yeah, phase three. So some of phase two is there's some carryover with that phase one and fun. Now, you'll notice aerobic conditioning. Aerobic conditioning starts to become in. You can start not only teaching kids about conditioning their heart and lungs, but you can actually incorporate that, longer bouts of activity, very safely. And this other thing, these other pieces, these other skills, they can be fun, but more sports specific.
fun, but more sports specific, rather than maybe just games and relays. All sports, all kids have favorite drills that they do. And I think if you ask at the end of a practice, okay, you guys can do any drill you want, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do this. And they're going to want to do that probably because they have a chance of success, they get a chance to be a part of the action, and this is all ages. I asked a Grand Valley football player in class a couple years ago, we were t talking about this very topic, and I said, what is your favorite thing that you get to do in practice? Childlike, he said to me, oh, at the end of practice, at the end of practice, we, I can't think what they call it, he said, coach, let's just do one-on-one, -on -one, where everyone gets to be the quarterback, everyone gets to be a receiver, everyone gets to be a defender, and we're in lines, and it's all, it's, someone's throwing a bomb, you know, whoever's the quarterback is throwing a bomb, one's the defender, one's the receiver, and it's just one-on-one, -on -one, full field, so if you catch it, it's a touchdown. He said, oh, we love it. Oh, guys, kill each other. It's so fun. He said, but I never get to throw the ball. I'm a lineman. And he was a lineman. We're talking a lineman. <laughs> he talked about he started his career on the farm being a, talk about growth and development. He grew up on the farm riding sheep. And then in fifth grade, he grew early and grew to be a very, like, close, over 200-pound boy and he had to stop because the sheep couldn't hold him anymore. <laughs> but I will have you know that young man has graduated, is in grad school, and had a wonderful, successful career. Some other things start to happen more along the emotional social piece, and I think we probably, those of you who coach, know this. If it hasn't happened already, peers become more important. Adults, they want less authority from you. Sexual, they're interested in the opposite sex, and sex in general, in a big way. There's a lot of moods and stuff going on, moody stuff going on. This is where, as coaches, self-worth becomes important. From a growth and developmental perspective, this is a really good time, coaches, for you to think about ways to share your power with them. Share some say in what goes on on the team. Personal values influenced by adults they admire. That adult better be you, right? And we'll talk about why here in a minute. 16 to 18, notice that fun never leaves. And these, these, the skill development and conditioning becomes more intense in, and, and continues to build on each other. And actually, We'll have a session on strength and conditioning at some point coming up, and you'll see how this piggybacks on to that. And you'll notice practices per competition. Typically by now you have two competitions a week and four practices. Again, peer group and sexual behavior become very are very important. But this is the other piece at this age, and I want you to see this when it comes to self-worth. Self want and need. Not just want, need responsibility. Physically, physically they're at a point where they, you can teach strategy, you can condition them, weight train them, they can catch on the skills, but there's another piece of it. There's a social emotional piece, growth and developmentally. And maybe perhaps when you're in your um, groups later, Number eight talks about how knowing, knowing that this is an important piece of helping young people develop is helping them take responsibility. How can you build that in? And then this would be your seniors and then beyond into college, and I'm not going to talk about that. This is what I do want to talk about, and this will be our last conversation because I'm running out of time, and I'm going fast. Grand Rapids Public Schools, and I say this not to, this, I always hesitate. My, my doctoral work was with middle school Hispanic children, and we know there's statistics out there about their, their health and well-being and physical activity levels. 
this slide is in no way meant to demonize anybody. Grand Rapids Public Schools, about 90% of their children are, come from poor homes. So all this growth and development stuff that we just talked about becomes variable, much more variable, and much less generalizable because poverty intersects. So your expectations, for instance, I talked about high school kids wanting and needing and being ready for leadership and wanting to take responsibility. Poor homes, children from poverty or poor homes may or may not have an idea and been given opportunities to develop those skills and may not be able to take those reins and know how to take those reins. You are the teacher. You are the teacher. So our choice there is to get frustrated and say, and I, I've heard lots of frustration. These kids, they, they don't do this, they don't know how to do that, they, you know, I can't get, you're right. You're right. Is it because they're awful kids? No. Nope. Is it because, it, no, it's because most likely they came from an environment that was in some way, there was disparity, tremendous disparity. Your job is much more important, and I'm going to say this, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Your job as a coach or an athletic director is so much more important than that job in East Grand Rapids or Rockford. So much more important because you really, truly can make a difference. You can teach kids things they're not going to get somewhere else. It's cool stuff, but we have to understand it. So low, low SES typically means less encouragement. Social encouragement from home, from peers, from friends, from teachers, and then, of course, less opportunity, and those equal low participation, particularly in your, your, some of your programs I hear I've heard coaches say I can't get anybody to go out and of course the, because there's a high intersection in the Grand Rapids Public Schools a huge intersection of race ethnicity and poverty there are all these other stereotypical statements that take over which are just that stereotypical it, it's about SES parent support research is clear Parent support and encouragement is the number one predictor of a child's success in sports. <coughs> Children from poor environments often don't get that import, important growth and developmental piece. And I've talked to many coaches here and I've heard that. So all those cool developmental milestones we just talked about, without this, you're probably going to look at a less developed person, player, physically, emotionally, mentally. N we know nutrition and lack of health care plays in to physical health, condition. We also know in poverty, the research is all over. Kids from poverty, they don't have equipment, they don't have as much access to practice and structure. What you do often see that, you know, they don't have structured environment to learn sports in, but they have an unstructured environment. So what we see is a, often a strong development of gross motor skills, and we often hear it stereotyped as raw talent. So this young man or young woman shows up to your team, and they, they, ha they are athletic specimen. But then they aren't very capable of catching, running, throwing, eye-hand coordination. So what you've got is this raw talent, this beautiful athlete with raw skill development and it gets frustrating because you're thinking, and I spent some time with a coach last semester, these kids have never played before. They're freshmen and they've never played the sport before. They don't know how to do this, they don't know how to, you're right, they don't. You're right, they don't. And you have the pleasure of making a difference by teaching them for the first time. You're their first teacher on many occasions. The other piece of this, poverty. We know poverty typically means less access to reading, 
writing, the intellectual development, being talked to by adults, adult conversation, interacting, ta you know, talking about anything. So you might have a team with a real wide, real, real wide array of intellectual understanding. You might find yourself saying, I've got all these athletes, but they can't catch on to anything. This is where the cultural, social cultural influence comes on growth and motor development. These are not what people would say. These are not dumb kids. These are kids who have not had an opportunity to have things broken down, to have multiple instructions multiple times, multiple chances at practice. What happens, and this is when we talk about growth and development and sports done right, is if we get caught in winning and we put winning ahead of our understanding of what's going on growth, with growth and development, this next one kicks in. We create a, a second class environment. Certain kids, you know, can figure it out, certain kids can't, we have kids pick on each other, we have coaches who only, you know, appeal to certain kids. And at a young age, what do we know? 70% of them drop out. And what do you think those 70% do once they drop out? Particularly when 90% of them are in poverty. They gotta, they gotta find something else to do. And, and they look for acceptance. So as you are looking through your case studies and you're trying to think about coaching your team with growth and development, social, emotional, physical development in mind, A, B, C. Winning somewhere else. Acceptance, belonging, competence. Those equal self-worth. Self-worth leads to retention. Retention leads to self-worth. And you are the foundation of all that. And I think that's pretty important stuff. I think that's pretty important stuff. And it makes me just extremely, extremely excited that you're here. Now, I moved fast and through a lot of stuff, which always seems to happen at these things. What I would invite you to do is, if, if you want to talk more, email me. If you would like me to come out and watch practice, I, I love doing that. I got a chance to do that on my sabbatical, watch a few as, as time would permit. But also, talk to your AD. And if your AD wants to arrange a coffee hour, Dr. Albrecht or I would be glad to try to arrange to come down and talk to a group of you about anything, okay? And I know I have a couple ADs in here, so take that, take that in your hat. Any questions that I can answer quickly before I know I need to let you move? Yeah. Not really size, but mm -hmm. level of skill. <coughs> um, does that factor in the, um, them want to con continue playing? Because if you're teaching them at a slower pace than everybody else, right. they tend to get bored also. Right. And that's a great question. That's a great question. So let's think about, first of all, make, make sure we've got that ABC thing in mind. Where are they going to get that? And then let's also keep in mind our duty of care to skill matching, okay? So and this, it's, this is more common. It seems like there's always one big guy yeah. rather than one big girl, mm -hmm. but it happens. So what you want to do, first of all, is you, the best thing is not to specialize that kid into one position at, at a young age, mm -hmm. but also make a decision about where's he gonna, where is this person going to benefit the most? You can move them up to play with like-sized players, 
physically there's a match, but emotionally and socially that's an issue. Right. You're, the, you're, yeah. 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 yeah, so your, your best bet is to, huh, it's not one size fits all. No, so, here, not. so here I am with your best bet. Your best bet is to perhaps someone, el someone else more his size will have to come. Somehow you'll have to match him with someone in practice. Or you will have to move him up because he's just clearly demolished. He's just, it's not safe. Yeah. That said, that said, it's really important to talk to the athlete and the athlete's parents, too, to see what they want to happen. Um, but what you really want to think about then is make sure that he's getting all the skills because he may not always be a post player or whatever but also just be very mindful of how he's matched up and who he's matched up against. And, yeah, there is no one. No, I understand. What you always want to be mindful of is that 6'9 kid and that 3-foot kid. You don't have them, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or play him in positions where he can't just crush people. But you're right, he has to be challenged. Right. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, I'm thinking perhaps most relevant to your feeder pattern time is number eight. Number two, which is kind of what you just talked to me about, and number four, which we kind of talked about. Because part of working with feeder patterns and meeting feeder patterns today is, I know, to have a discussion about, well, this is what I do, this is what we'd like you to do. And going back to that example of of asking a sixth grader to shoot three pointers at, you know, even if the form is wrong, that's a discussion. However, shooting a lot, shooting a lot and helping and, oh, and doing a lot of running, passing, catching and teaching kids to run and pass and catch, you can do that. That's a great idea. All right, I think it's, I think your next session's this way. Welcome. My name is Rick Albrecht, as Mr. Johnson just mentioned, and I'm a professor at Grand Valley State University. And we are going to be talking about a topic that's, well, we think about it as coaches, but we don't often put the proper perspective and the proper importance on it. Actually, to be, uh, to be really precise, there's nothing we do as coaches that's going to be more important than what we're going to be talking about in this particular session. We're going to be talking about safety and injury prevention. There's nothing more important than we do, that we do than protect the safety and protect our kids from being injured. That's our number one mission. When we were putting together the national standards for coaches, we sat around a table like this and said, okay, how are we going to order these? Because we know that when people look at the national standards, they're going to assume, maybe appropriately, maybe not, they're going to assume that number one is number one. It's more important than the rest, and so on and so forth. Number one we decided would be philosophy and ethics, because there's nothing more important than having the proper philosophy, that athlete-centered philosophy that we have to have. Athlete comes first. And actually that leads then in to number two, safety and injury prevention. So we're going to be talking about the various aspects of safety and injury prevention. But before we actually even get started, let me forward this slide so that we can see it. Now, you have a copy of all the slides with you. So even if they don't show up here on the screen, you can't read them here. You have them with you. You can still see a copy of each one. This is an extremely important point. GRPS, the place where you are employed, thinks that safety and injury prevention is so important, they have an, an actual written expectation of you. And it says, all GP, GRPS coaches, that's you, will ensure that the highest regards for safety and injury prevention are a priority while preparing and participating in practices and competitions. That's the expectation they have of you. You will do that if you're going to be employed here at GRPS. So we're going to be basing our discussion on that. And one of, the, one of the sheets that I handed out, 
has a whole bunch of cases on it. I think it has four, four cases on it, and we're going to be dealing with that first. What we're going to be doing is breaking it up. So maybe these first two tables here, if you'll take case number one, the legacy of Wes Leonard, read that case to yourself, discuss it amongst the, the, the members of your table, and then we'll ask you to sort of lead the discussion afterwards. The next two tables, if you'll look at case two there, playing through injury, look it over, talk with one another about it, and again, we'll have you sort of lead us through your thoughts when we have about five minutes to take a look at this. The table at the back and these first two tables here, how I many we have? Yeah, the first two tables here. Take a look at case three, preventing injuries at GRPF. Take a look at that, talk amongst yourself at those tables and see if you can come up with some, something that we need to concern ourselves with as a group after you've taken a look at that. And the last two tables, if you look at case four, the injuries on the field. We'll give you about five minutes or so to take a look at those, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them as a larger group. One point that I'll make here, this just regards another handout that we're not going to be specifically talking about today, rating yourself and others as coaches. This is a 30-point document, a 30-item document that you might want to take a look at to see how good of a coach you really, really are. Anyway, take about five minutes, and then we'll come back and look at that. <laughs> and, and we'll let the tables that discussed this give us what their thinking was, and we can all chime in on this as well. The first case was handled by these first couple tables here. It's called the Legacy of West Leonard. How many remember the tragic case of West Leonard nearby here? Down in Fenville, about an hour down the road. Uh, excellent, excellent athlete. Uh, playing in a basketball game, very important basketball game. He makes the winning shot of the game and drops over dead on the, on the court. That was back in 2011. So what did you guys come up with in terms of what we might be able to do that might at least minimize something like that happening? We just stand um, in your body, knowing your, knowing your body. The players or you the coach? Okay. The players being more in tune with what's going on with their bodies. Okay. So Make sure the players are in tune with their bodies. And you are sort of in tune with how they're doing too. And they know, you know, when they're not doing well. Okay, when they're feeling well. Not. Also being, uh, having that communication, constantly, constant communication about, 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 in, about what your body, about injuries, being, being vocal about what you're feeling, about injuries okay. and stuff. Okay, that's a good point. Good point, being, being in touch with your body so that you feel these injuries. Now something like a heart attack, there may not be as much as like a knee injury or something like that, but yeah. Good points. Good points. Yes. They also we talk about a lot that to keep it from happening, it's about impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even a normal physical one of cause yeah. what he had. Yeah. So I mean it's hard because you got insurance issues and things like yep. that. But we did also talk about having the proper training and equipment on step hand, so if something like that happens. What do you mean? You talk about equipment for a minute. No. The okay. And, uh, Knowing how to use it and having the CPR and first aid and okay. being prepared and trained and having plans in okay. place so that if that stuff happens, you do, you can. These days, even said if that stuff was in place, that most likely he could have still be here. Not for sure things, mm -hmm. stuff is for sure. Mm -hmm. But so if that stuff would happen, all right, we know where the AD is, we know how to use it, we Good know point. all this stuff, we know, <coughs> you know, you do this, you do that, we have the plan, we're good to go. Those are great points. It's all about being prepared. Now, a case like this, it's hard to see it coming. It, now, there are certain physical examinations that can be given, and more and more schools are going in this direction where they are actually, as part of the pre-participation physical exam, they're doing things like echocardiograms and things of that nature, but that may be pretty hard to come by. They're pretty, pretty expensive. Uh, now, there are certain risk factors, not necessarily for, for that condition, but how many of you have ever heard of Marfan's disease? Anybody ever hear that? Who knows what it is? Who can? It's like a long bone. Okay. Typically, their heart is weak as well. Okay. You see it in a lot of like volleyball players or basketball players. Ba volleyball players, basketball players, long, thin athletes. Now, very often.
in many sports, like volleyball and basketball, we think that that's actually a good thing. We talk about having an athlete having length or having, having long extremities. The problem is when they have exaggerated extremities, and uh, this happens in, in all sports. Uh, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Who's, who's the great swimmer right now? Yeah, Phelps. Phelps is borderline Marfan's. If you've ever seen this guy, there's, there's a way that we can actually at least have a little red flag when we look at somebody, whether they may be susceptible to something like this. What is it? Do you know how to give them an eyeball check? We're talking about length here. Oh, yeah. Stand like this. If their wingspan is greater than their height, now you have at least a little red flag. Doesn't mean necessarily, but I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Phelps, and uh, it's just amazing. I mean, he can wrap his arms all the way around himself, basically. Uh, but again, it's those kinds of things. But then, exactly right, we have to make sure that we're prepared. We have the equipment, the AEDs. Now, this happened nearby. It wasn't here at GRPS. But here's what can happen even with the AEDs. And, and it's, it's great that you said we know how to work them. We have access to them and so forth. We know where they are. In, just outside of Grand Rapids, I'm not going to tell you what school, just outside of Grand Rapids, they had an emergency like this. Kid went down. Kid was dying right there on the, on, on the court. It was at a practice. They had an AED at that, at, at that school. And the coach knew that. And the problem is the coach didn't know where it was. Do you know where that AED was being held? It was in the nurse's office, locked. Yeah, no, that's going to really help, right? They may as well not even, why, why bother spending a thousand bucks on this thing, really? You've got to be kidding me. Locked. Yeah? Here's another one. State of Michigan, but further away from Grand Rapids. Same thing. Now, this one, they found it. They had access to it. They brought it in. Went to hook it up. The battery was dead. You know whose job that is? Well, it's a lot of people's job, but it's also your job. You need to know that. So part of the point about having the equipment, knowing that it's accessible, enormously, enormously important. Very good points all the way around. We have to be prepared. That's, that's sort of the key to it, it, it itself. Case number two, playing through injury. OK, we got this, this, this uh, basketball player, Margie. She gets injured. It's bad, but not like hugely bad. She sort of would like to continue to play. The trainer. Uh, advises you to not play her. Are you ever going to play her under these conditions? Do you play Margie at all? Does anybody play her? What about even when the parents come down and say, you know, she's, a, she's getting ready to finish her career here. This is, means a great deal to her. I think you should let her play. Did mom and dad say that. You going to play her? Under no conditions? <laughs> There are three Division I college coaches up in the stands, and they've already told you that they come here to look at her? No? Yeah? It's not just one game, is it? I mean, this one game isn't the thing. If they don't know enough about her already, they don't know enough about her. OK? OK? So under no conditions. Anybody, anybody disagree, have a different opinion? Cool. Excellent. Preventing injuries at GRPS. What's, this is the next one that we had. What's the worst injury you guys can recall seeing, and how might it have been prevented? What did you, you come up with? We had two deaths. Two deaths? And what happened? Well, one, I had a guy that had meningitis, and that was pretty much, well, what was your culture then? No. Okay. <laughs> what? What? Just generally, what happened, and well, what could, could have been, been done been to maybe yeah. prevent this? I think his parents, once we sent him home, uh, considered the flu the same way we did, and if he had went to the hospital earlier, it might have been prevented. Okay. Maybe what could have been done differently? He should have went straight to the hospital with the flu-like symptoms, uh, with the high fever. He probably should have went right to the hospital instead of letting him sleep. By the time he made it to the hospital, he was in a coma. So, so again, being aware of illness and injury that the, that the players have and how they're feeling. Yeah, and my, that made me, like, now if my kids get the flu at all, I'll take them to the hospital. Yeah. I'm still going to be that way. I yeah. get some Tylenol. Yeah. Good point. It's not only injuries. It, it can be illness.
illnesses too that, that can that can be really damaging as well. Anybody else? What else did you see? Uh, hey, that had a broken clavicle this year. Broken like clavicle. In wrestling. Like yeah. Off a of half Nelson, uh, the opponent sat him down pretty hard on his shoulder, yeah. and his clavicle snapped. Yeah. So what, what was there anything that could have been done to maybe minimize the chances of that happening? I always tell my wrestlers that it's your responsibility to return that opponent safely to the mat and not slam him. I mean, this kid did nothing le illegal from Zealand. It was just a freak accident that happened. Yeah. And Interesting point, the, yeah. the point that you make about you as a player are responsible for the opponent's safety as well as your own. Very interesting point. Excellent. Anything else? What else did you see? Anybody else see a big injury? This was happened 20 some years ago. I was coaching cross country at Union. And it was in August before school started. We had a meet at Johnson Park. And then uh, the next, that night, a senior who died during his sleep, aneurysm. Okay. And the uh, first thing that was, uh, Mel Atkins asked me was, did he have a physical? Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And, uh, but as far as any preventive, any, he did have a physical. He did have a physical? Yeah. And that's why I stress that I don't let anybody practice without a physical. Great point. We're going to be talking about that. We're making a point of that later. Uh, nobody plays, nobody practices without a physical. Absolutely right. For part of that reason. That's an excellent point. Good, good. Yes? I was at a basketball game. I wasn't a game that I was coaching myself, but I was at a basketball game, and I seen a kid take a charge, and he fell back and hit his head on the floor. Okay. And um, I think they ended up diagnosing with a concussion. Okay. But I think a preventative way to do that is just teaching your kids how to walk. Okay. Okay. So proper technique, uh, proper proper skills, proper technique. You saw the basketball player took the, takes the charge, takes it too hard in a sense, goes down, hits the head. Okay. 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 Good. Or maybe you know, you, you don't you get into this issue of flopping. You don't want to be flopping all the time too. So sometimes you don't take the charge at all, perhaps. But yeah, yeah. Good point. Excellent cases. The point here is we can always do something. It may not take it away entirely. It may not remove. There's always going to be a risk. We'll talk about that. But there's always something we could have done to minimize the chances of really bad stuff happening. Uh, we get this last one here, injuries on the field. Uh, assume that you're a baseball softball coach, and you look up, and all of a sudden your center fielder is just covered with blood. And it turns out what had really happened is the high school kids used your field as a party central and they broke some beer bottles out in center field and the kid dove for a ball and just ripped himself wide open as a result of those broken bottles out on the playing field. Whose fault is that? Of course, the kids who broke the bottles, but beyond that. Okay, long and short of it is, you don't want to hear this, it's our responsibility. That we're responsible for that. We're responsible for the playing conditions and the safety of the playing conditions. It's one of our, our first obligations. And I, 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 I can use this case because actually this case is me. I was the coach when this happened. Uh, from that point on, before every practice, and in practice, not just competitions, practice, that's where a lot of the stuff happens. Before every practice, we would line up, the entire team would. And it's time for us to talk to one another a little bit and just to horse around, but with an activity in mind that we're, we're, we're scanning the field and we, we, we go back and forth. The whole field is covered before we actually play our first, uh, our first play. So we take care of it from that point on, but what are you going to do now? Let's make this case even a little bit worse. This looked pretty bad. He was all ripped up and the blood was flowing. But let's make it really worse. He dives. He doesn't just get some blood vessels cut. He cuts an artery. And the blood is squirting out three feet in the air. What are you going to do? You're going to put pressure on it. So you're talking first aid here. Number one, you're going to have to know a little bit about first aid. You're going to have to know, what do I do when this happens? And yet you're absolutely right. Pressure is the first kind of thing. But there's some other things that kind of go with this too. What are you going to do about the other kids on the team who are screaming and squealing 
and they're all standing around and they're doing, what are you going to do? Get them to go away? They ain't going away. You better have an emergency action plan in effect before this happens. Not when it's happening. This is no time to start thinking. When that blood is squirting three feet in the air, you don't start thinking now. You start reacting. You know what you're going to do. And the first thing you do is you clear the area on your way running to the kid. You're clearing the area because what you have done in the past with your emergency action plan, you have gone over with all of your team. When I say a key word, no questions asked, you all have one job. You get your tails over and you get on that bench. That's what you all do. And, and mine was code red. When I, when I hollered red, something serious was going on. And I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to talk about it. You get over there. Everybody is over there on code red. So you don't have to be messing with them at all. So you're yelling code red as you're running out to that player when you see that he's down. So you're already cleaning, it, clear, clearing the field and getting things ready. The next thing is, what, you're going to apply pressure. You're going to do the first aid that you're going to learn about, that you're going to be certified to do. But then what? You better call for help. That's right. You better know who to call. Now, in the olden days, we had a problem that everybody didn't have phones. Now people carry phones all the time. That's usually not a problem. Make sure you do have a phone with you. But here's the problem, too. Think about this. This is why you have to plan in advance. You have to have it written down. You have to practice it with your team because things happen. What about you, I'll give you an example. This comes from one of my colleagues at GVSU. He was uh, an athletic trainer at the University of Florida. He was doing baseball. Baseball player got hurt. It was a spinal injury. Serious, big time serious. They called 911. They sent the ambulance. The ambulance got there and couldn't get into the field. Like many of our venues, Fences all the way around the field and gates and a padlock on the gate. How does the ambulance get into the field to actually pick this guy up? Big problem. You better have that figured out ahead of time. Again, while they're down there dying, there's no time for you to start thinking about what it is you're going to do. That's part of your plan. You know. You know the directions. You know exactly what field you're at. You know that how to get there, where, where, where it is. You know everything about it. Your, other, your, your assistant coaches should know. Even your athletes should know in case they have to make a call and you're, you're busy working on this injured athlete. But you have to practice it. Okay. Enormously important. Let's get down to business. We're going to talk about each one of these points, and we're going to go over them pretty quickly, but you have... The handouts, you have all the slides right in front of you. But we'll make a couple of points that are relevant to everything that we've been talking about up to this juncture. You have nine legal duties as a coach. We talk an awful lot about coaches' responsibilities and what they can be sued for and so forth. Here's the, here's the fact that you don't want to know. You can be sued for anything. <laughs> That's all there is to it. There's no, there's no limit on what you can be sued for. I can sue you for being in here today with a gray shirt on. Now, I'm not going to win my suit, but I can sue you for that. <laughs> as long as I've got the $15 or $20 for the application, I can sue you for it. Now, I'm going to lose my case because that's a pretty shaky case. But that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to make their cases shaky. That is, we're going to protect ourselves. We cannot protect ourselves from being sued. We cannot protect our institutions from being sued. But we can make our cases so solid that it won't be that productive to be sued anyway. Let us not forget that the idea here is not to protect ourselves or our institution. The whole point here is to protect our athletes. Don't get confused. Now, it's a very nice thing that in the process of protecting our athletes, we can protect ourselves legally as well. But first and foremost, the only thing we're concerned about is the safety of our athletes. That's why we actually do this. It's just an added benefit. It's frosting on the cake that we protect ourselves this as well. You have these nine legal duties because when you go to court, 
But if you look at all of the court cases, we have any lawyers in here? You go to court, and you will find, if you take all of the court cases as a whole, it's these nine things that they're always looking for. This is what, when people get caught and they're found guilty, this is what's happened. You have to properly plan all activities. They're going to ask you, first thing you get on the stand, they're going to say, have you actually taught them how to do all this stuff? Do you properly plan your activities? And you're going to say to them probably yes. How many of you have? Maybe you don't have to raise your hand. You know, I don't want you to actually give yourself away here. Think about it to yourself, though. Do you have a written practice plan for every practice in terms of what you covered? Do you take attendance at every single practice? If you don't, you're already putting yourself liable in that regard. And I'll tell you why. It's a true case again out of baseball. Coach moves the second baseman out to the, out to the outfield, out to the left field. He's never played out there before, but it moves him out there in a practice. Ball comes out. Kid loses in the sun. Ball comes down, knocks his eye out. Kid's blind for us, forever. A lot of medical bills. The family has to sue just to start paying the medical bills. They sue the school, they sue the coach, they sue everybody to get the money that's needed to take care of this kid. They go to court. Very first question that really slick attorneys will ask is, did you teach this kid how to do this? Did you give him proper instruction? Has he ever played in the outfield? Did you teach him how to protect himself and to, to block the, the, the sun when a fly ball is coming out? Did you teach him how to protect himself when he does, in fact, lose it to turn around and just get the heck out of there? Did you, did you actually teach him that stuff? If yes, you're going to step two. But most of us don't have that already because they're going to say, prove it. Where's your documentation? Prove that you showed that kid how to do it. Is it in your plan, in your, in your practice plan? If you, it's not in your practice plan, you didn't do it because you don't have any proof of it. Next question, was the kid there that day anyhow? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You don't take attendance? I don't know. That's why they take attendance even when you come to these things. They have to know who's here and who's had this information and who hasn't. You have to document. You have to know. You have to properly plan all activities. You have to provide proper instruction. Uh, you have to give them the instruction. We talked a little bit about it in some of these cases. You have to make sure that they're doing it properly and in a safe manner. You have to warn against inherent risks. You have to tell the parents in particular, parents and guardians, but also the players, they have to know what the risks are in terms of playing this particular sport. All sports have risks. You're going to minimize that, and you're going to tell them how you're going to minimize that, but there are still risks involved. They can, they can only give their informed consent to play, to practice, to let their kids play in practice if they know what the risks actually are. You have to tell them or else the court is not going to be amused. You have to provide a safe environment. We talked about that. You have to uh, provide safe equipment. You have to inspect the equipment. We'll talk about that in a second. You have to match your athletes appropriately in terms of size and skill. I came into a previous session here. They were talking about, in some cases, they were going to have, you know, they didn't have enough players on all the teams and so forth. They were going to have the sixth graders playing with the eighth graders. Oh, really? I can see a problem already. Sixth graders and eighth graders, just in terms of growth spurts and, and differences in people, many of you, and you've seen this, you've got people who are grown adults, basically, playing with little kids. They've gone through the growth spurt, others have not. You've got people six foot three, six foot four, playing against five foot 11, or four foot 11. That's your job to make sure they don't get hurt. You have to match them up appropriately. Now, a lot of times we think, oh, hey, that's all what sport is all about, is getting mismatches. No, and especially in practice, not mismatches. You better match them up because the court, again, is not going to be thrilled when you show up and somebody's been seriously injured. Take your wrestling example, broken clavicle. They come in there. Let's say it's been a broken neck. You go to court. And they find out, well, gee, now wrestling takes care of itself because of weight classes a little bit. But 
they find that one of the kids is six foot four and weighs 220 pounds, and the other kid is five foot two and weighs 101 pounds. Uh, that's not going to go very well. That's your job to make sure that that doesn't happen. You're putting them in an unsafe environment. You have to evaluate your, your athletes for injury and illness, just like you said. Absolutely, illness too. You have to supervise all activities closely, and you have to provide appropriate emergency assistance. These are the things the courts are going to look at. They're going to go right down the list. And if there's no in there anywhere, we're in big trouble. Let's go through them very, very quickly, just sort of point by point. Again, you have the handouts here. If we don't spend enough time on them, you know what we're talking about here now. First aid CPR. Here are the key points. You've got to be certified. My bias is you're not certified, you don't get on the field. That's all there is to it. You don't coach. You don't have first aid certification, CPR certification, you're going to kill somebody and you don't get out there. That's all there is to it. You must carry an appropriately stocked first aid kit to every practice and every game. What's appropriately stocked, they can help you with that. Make sure, because it's a little bit different for each sport, make sure it's appropriately stocked. You have what you need there on your first aid kit and you have it with you. Again, it's like the AED we were talking about earlier. What good is it if you're not taking it with you to all the practices, all the games? Everyone should have one. You must develop and rehearse that emergency action plan that we were talking about and rehearse it. And then, of course, you must give appropriate emergency assistance when it is required. You have to collect athlete information. Now, this also plays into the first aid to some degree. You have meetings with your parents and your guardians before the season starts. Great place to actually collect a lot of essential information that has safety implications associated with it. Here's what we're talking about here. Collect important athlete information during that parent orientation session. You get the informed consent form, so you have to do the, the, uh, uh, the, the warning. You have to let them know what the, what the inherent risks are in participating in this sport. You have to get and collect uh, health history in, uh, the health history form where it talks about health issues and special medications and activity restrictions. Do they have asthma? Do they, uh, do they have epilepsy? Do they have, are they allergic to bee stings? Here's the deal. You're going to be out on the field. You're going to be looking around and boom, one of your players just falls over, absolutely falls over in what appears to be a coma. Okay, can, I, can you imagine the panic here? You're responsible. You don't know what's happened. You don't know whether they have a diabetic coma. You don't know whether they're, they're, they have epilepsy. You don't know whether they are allergic to bee stings and they just got bit. You don't know anything. First of all, how are you going to provide any kind of emergency care? You don't know what's going on. They're sort of semi or unconscious. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, call 911, but, but what? If you knew in advance, and your parents had told, their parents had told you that they have this condition, and maybe diabetic, and they have some insulin, or whatever the case is, they, they provide you with it. You're ready, you're fine, you can take care of that. Panic sets in, and you don't want panic if you don't know what you're talking about. You get that information from all of the parents. You have an emergency information card that tells you about the contact information, how to contact the parents in case of an emergency, how to contact a physician. You get a permission to treat form in case they need treatment and you can't get a hold of the parents. All of these documents, you know what? They go in a plastic bag, alphabetically, and you put them in your first aid kit, kit which we already said you're going to have with you at every practice anyway, practice in every game. They're always there with you. They're in a plastic bag. They're never going to be all wet and torn and whatever. They're going to be right there for you to use whenever you want. Facilities and equipment. We need to make sure that we inspect for safety every one of the facilities and for before every practice and every competition. All the playing surfaces, all the facilities, everything needs to be inspected. A sport specific and location specific checklist is going to help you out a whole lot where you don't have to think about, well, what am I looking at? You go right through and check, 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 check for your sport, for your location to make sure that you're looking at the things that are most problematic here. And, and the, the, the district can give you that. Potential hazards also include weather conditions. Now around here we don't worry too much about heat and cold, but 
We have to be concerned that about this time of year, it can get up into the hundreds. And, and humidity can be nearly that as well. And that produces its own environmental risks for our athletes. Lightning is something that we have to be thinking about too. How many of you ever heard of the 30-30 rule for lightning? It goes like this. If you're going to be counting the seconds between the thunder and the lightning, as you know, lightning, speed of light is a lot faster than the speed of sound. You already knew this. You know this from every storm. You see lightning, you start to count. If you can count to 30 and beyond, you're okay. But if that, if that thunder comes before you reach 30, it's too close. You've got to get out of there. The other 30 comes in, those are the number of minutes that you have to wait after the last lightning flash before you go back out onto the playing surface. 30, 30. 30 seconds, 30 minutes. We have to be concerned about that from time to time for our players and for ourselves as well. Um, you have to make the corrections for all potentially harmful uh, conditions, uh, facilities uh, that, that can be problematic, or else you can actually cancel if necessary, pull them off the field. You cannot risk their safety. I have been with hockey teams who have pulled the team off the ice and said, we're not playing on this surface. With all the ruts and gouges in the surface, we're not going to play. With the broken glass, we're not going to play. With the gate that goes into the player's box, it's not hinged. It, it comes open every time somebody bumps it. It comes open. Somebody's going to get hurt. We're not playing. We don't care. You're going to make us cancel? You go ahead. We'll, 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 we'll deal with that later. But we're not playing because it's not safe to be here. And we have to make sure that we are willing to take those kinds of things. And then document everything that needs to be changed. Pass it on to your AD. Now it's their responsibility to make sure it gets done. And you keep checking on them, too. Um, the athletic, you have to inspect the equipment as well as the facilities. And make sure you inspect it regularly. And what we're talking about here are all equipment, pieces of equipment, bats, rackets, balls, shoes, everything. But particularly, we're going to spend a lot of time making sure that our protective equipment, the face masks, the helmets, the pads, the mouth guards, those kinds of things are in good physical condition and can do what it is they're designed to do, and that is to protect the safety of our athletes. We have to inspect those. Go back to the legal duties. One of the things they're going to ask you if somebody gets their teeth knocked in, when, did they have a mouth guard? Why not? Was the mouth guard functioning? Did you inspect it? Those kinds of things. Face mask, was it on? Was it functioning? They're going to ask you these questions. We have to have the answers. Inspection should be made for proper fit as well as just wear and tear and some other things. A lot of times we get equipment that's handed down from an older player to his brother or sister later. Uh, the stuff doesn't fit. It's not designed to fit. Sometimes even within our school uh, supported equipment, we, the stuff is worn out. It's not been replaced. That's our job to make sure that this is good protective equipment before we assign it. Parents and guardians and the athletic administration have to be notified if new equipment or it needs to be replaced, if it's worn out and so forth. Who can play? We talked a little bit about this earlier in one of the cases. All athletes have to have an appropriate participation physical exam before they can be allowed into practice. All of them. I know. I know this for a fact. A couple, three years ago at GRPS, there were coaches who were allowing players to start practice in the fall before they had physical examinations. No. No. Never. Physical exam. Think back to West, Le West Leonard again. He goes down. He dies. First thing they're going to ask you, physical exam? You were talking about a physical exam earlier, too. Physical exam? If your answer is no, whew, whew, I don't want to be you. I don't want to be you. One more day, a couple more days of not practicing, you'll get over it. But not when they're dead. Decisions regarding returning to playing after injury or illness be made by medical personnel. That got into, you know, case number two, and you answered it absolutely correctly. No, we don't let them in. We don't make that decision. When the medical team says okay, it's okay. We aren't medically trained. We don't put them back in there. Proper conditioning. 
Athletes have to undergo fitness screening at the beginning of the season. Make sure that you test for relevant strength, flexibility, endurance, uh, body composition. You're going to be asking them to do stuff when they show up. Are they ready to do the stuff you want them to? Are they ready to do the drills and the exercises and the conditioning that you're going to do in your practice? Are they ready for that? You better know. Don't assume they can already do this. And don't assume they can do it just because you want them to be able to do it. You test them. That's how you know. All drills and conditioning should be based on a logical progression. They get progressively more difficult. You don't skip steps. Once they master one level, they can go on to the next. Once they get into a certain conditional level, they can go on to the next, not before. There has to be a progression. You don't jump just because you don't have time. You don't have time to teach you all that. So we'll just skip right to step number six. It doesn't work that way. Proper warm-up and cool-down should be part of every practice and every competition. Weather conditions, we mentioned that a minute ago, but weather conditions like heat, humidity, precipitation, whether the field's wet and that sort of thing, they need to be considered when engaging in physical activity. If it's 100 degrees out and nearly 100% humidity, you might not be able to do what you wanted to do in practice today. You may have to go without pads. You may have to go without helmets. You may have to cut back. That's fine. You'll get over it, again, as long as you're not dead. And never, ever, 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 ever withhold water from your athletes. Now, in my day, you can see how old I am. In my day, they used to withhold water all the time. They thought it was a sign of weakness if you were always drinking water. Well, we know better than that now. You're going to kill somebody if you don't give them proper hydration. And in fact, you should be telling them that they need to be hydrated properly before they show up because if they're just drinking at practice, it's probably too late. If you rely on your thirst mechanism, if you rely on being thirsty to, to guide your drinking, you're already dehydrated. They need to be drinking through the day to get ready for their practice if it's going to be especially in hot and humid conditions and so forth. But you need to make sure that you give them an adequate number of breaks. It's not going to make them... Uh, uh, less competitive. It, it, it's not going to be a sign of weakness if they have to drink. So make sure you're not withholding that. Proper techniques. You've got to be taught only proper and safe techniques in the sport. And we talked about this a second ago. Great point that you made. We're worried about the safety of our athletes and also the safety of other athletes. We're not only protecting our own. We're protecting everybody here. So proper technique is to protect our athletes, sure, but also the competitors as well. Absolutely right. Uh, watch for poor mechanics that might contribute to an injury and be aware of excessive conditioning. People who work too much, too hard, have played too much so that actually they're, they're risking an overuse in injury. There was a case just a couple weeks ago, I think it was in Iowa, they took away the state baseball uh, title from a baseball team high school baseball team, took it away from them because their pitcher had pitched too many innings. That was put into effect to keep them from developing overuse injuries. They violated it. I think he exceeded it by three innings. They took the state title away from them. And I don't have any problem with that. These rules are put in there for that, that reason, for safety. Keep accurate records. Here, you're going to hate this. There's not a coach I've ever met who doesn't hate keeping records. Everybody hates it. But it's a part of what we have to do. We've already talked about it directly and indirectly uh, when we were talking about going to court and those kinds of things. But you need to develop a detailed practice plan for the reasons that we've already specified. You have to make sure that you can demonstrate exactly what you do. Now, you're also going to, in the process, put together things in the right order, which is good, and it's good for uh, the actual instruction that, that comes with this. Uh, seasonal practice plans. You have to have, know what you want to do from sort of the beginning of the season to the, to the end, and you have to put, sort of insert into that daily practice plan. These all have to be written, and then you have to have them in a place where you can actually show them to people because they're not going to just take your word for, oh, yes, I do that. You're going to have to actually demonstrate that you do it. You're also going to have to, as we mentioned before, take attendance. You're going to have to know who was there 
did they receive that proper technique, uh, uh, skill, uh, skill technique uh, instruction that you gave them? Were they even there? If they weren't there, a lot of, a lot of players and, and parents specifically don't like it with you miss a practice, you don't play in the game. Here's how I used to handle it. It's not a punishment kind of thing. You know, if you miss a practice, you don't play in the game this week because we taught certain things during that practice. You weren't there. You, therefore, are not, not only will you not perform them properly and reduce our performance, but more importantly, you can get hurt because we taught you how to protect yourself. You weren't here, you don't play. So that's the way you handle the absences at practice as well. You don't play, not for punishment, it's just that we don't want you to get hurt. Uh, you need to provide evidence that people receive their instruction. You need to make sure that you have daily uh, or you, uh, complete injury reports. Very specific injury reports. Anytime there's an injury, you have to have put it together. You have to make sure that you've detailed what happened, where it happened, why it happened, uh, what the whole set of circumstances were, what your reaction was, everything. You have to have continuous supervision. You're always responsible for everything your athletes do before practice, during practice, and after practice. Give you one very quick example. I know I'm wasting a lot of time here, but the examples are really important. Basketball. Basketball coach was done with practice. He said, okay, everybody take off, everybody go home. He went home. A couple of the kids stayed behind in the gym. They had their own basketball, and when he left, they were out there horsing around, and they were practicing their 360 dunks and all that sort of thing. Well, we all know these, these pull-down, snap-back rims. Pulled down, another kid had his hand in there. He's going to block the shot, snap back up, took his fingers right off. Whose fault was it? Coaches. Coaches. Left them unsupervised. What happens if your players don't have their ride to go home? You dismissed it. And they're standing out there. And you say, you got to ride home? Yeah, my mom's supposed to come. Is she coming? Well, you don't know. You leave, and something happens to that kid. You got some issues. You got some issues. Before, during, and after. Structure activities that every athlete is always supervised at all times. Drugs, alcohol, supplements. Very quickly, you are a primary role model for these kids. Never attend practices or games with alcohol in your breath. Never use any form of, of tobacco products in the presence of your athletes. They'll follow your lead. Never suggest to your athletes that they need to take some form of supplement to enhance their performance, like an energy drink or no dose or whatever. You're just telling them that they cannot do it on their own. They don't have the, the, what it takes in, as an individual. They need extra supplements. First of all, you do know supplements, no one has ever tested supplements. We don't know if they work. We don't know if they're safe. Supplements are supplements. They're not drugs. Do not assume the government has tested a supplement. That stuff you get down at GNC, none of it has ever, well, I can't say that. I can't say it's never been tested. It doesn't have to be tested. They don't have to prove or demonstrate to anybody that it works. They don't have to prove or demonstrate that it's even safe. The government makes a distinction between a drug and a supplement. When you take dietary supplement, all bets are off. Might work, might not, might be safe, might not. We don't test them. You're on your own. Drugs are different. That's why nobody who makes these products wants to be called a drug. They want to be called a supplement. So don't assume that they work. You're usually, most of the time, you end up with very expensive urine. <laughs> it just goes in one side and out the other. In the worst case, it can also be dangerous, especially if you mix products. Observe your athletes in terms of, and listen to what they say in terms of drug use and parties and things of that nature. Hazing bullying, last point here basically. Be aware the GRPS has a hazing bullying policy. You better know what it is, you better follow it. Understand that hazing and bullying happens at every age, both genders and all sports. They've had 
examples of this going down to the first and second grade. Happens on girls' teams as much, if not worse, than on many boys' teams. Don't assume that just because of who you're working with, it ain't going to happen. It is. You're going to be the last to know, by the way. That's what every coach who's ever had an issue over hazing and bullying, every coach says, I didn't know. I wasn't aware of that. No, that's not going to pass. It's your job to be aware of it. Understand that no form of hazing or no form of bullying should ever be tolerated, even silly stuff, because silly stuff has a tendency to grow. You know what happens with even silly little hazing? You do it to the freshmen, and then they become sophomores and juniors and seniors, and then it's their turn, and they keep jacking it up every year. It won't be long. You're going to have a real mess on your hands, even if it started off pretty silly. Understand that you have to be on the constant lookout for evidence of any indication that might be happening on your team. Some final points. Uh, sport injuries won't ever be totally eliminated, but it's our job to reduce them as best we can. You have legal responsibilities that we talked about here. Make sure you meet those. If you do, you're going to be in pretty good shape. They won't take care of all the injuries. Injuries will happen, but you will have done your best, and that's all we can ask. Most of what is expected of us is simply common sense, but we don't always use common sense. Your athletes are counting on you. You have to keep in mind that you're the person most responsible for providing all of your athletes with physical and emotional environment that's safe because it's your job. Your job is to always make sports fun and to always make sports safe. So with that, thank you very much. You did a great job on those cases. I appreciate it. And if I can be of any help, let me know.